Hi everyone, uh, so we're here today with Professor Stephen Bending, who is a lecturer in 18th century literature at the University of Southampton. Um, and Stephen is a specialist in uh, gardens in the 18th century. So he's published uh, really widely um, on this topic, including uh, a 2013 book called Green Retreats, Women, Gardens and 18th Century Culture. Um, and more recently, an edited collection, a Cultural History of Gardens in the Age of Enlightenment. Um, he's also working on a new book at the moment, which we're going to be talking about um, in a little bit. Um, but first of all, Stephen, thank you very much for being with us. It's really nice to, uh, to have you here and to chat to you about your research. Um, I want to start off by thinking about your first book, um, which was thinking about women, um, 18th century women and their gardens. And I wondered if you could open by saying a little bit um, about um, how women were expected to behave in garden spaces and how this might um, differ from their male counterparts. Um, so were women involved in landscape design um, and what did gardening kind of look like for women during this period? Yeah, no, thanks. It's, um, I think one of the things with uh, women in gardens in the 18th century is that they tend to be associated with things like flower gardens with small scale gardens. Um, Flower gardens because they're they're domestic because it's uh, they're easily kind of moralised and so on and you get endless um, books written and articles written about how women are um, just like flowers themselves and need to be cultivated and so on and um, you know weeds need to be rooted out those those kinds of things um, but there's a there's a smaller number of women who who um, did garden on a, on a large scale um, and so. Um, weren't just concerned with flower gardens, although they, you know, they had them, um, but were producing the same kinds of gardens as, as men produced. Um, the problem for women is that um, they're not seen in the same kind of way, precisely because they're linked with the domestic, with um, the small scale and so on. Um, so that book was really about um, how, how, how do women feel in gardens, if you like? Um, how do they uh, respond to a very kind of male world of garden design um, and some of them did the same as men did they just brought in a, a male gardener like um, Capability Brown a um, bunch of them garden for themselves um, but we're also seen as kind of quirky for doing that because if you're if you've got enough land to garden on a large scale you're very well to do um, why are you doing manual labor um, and so yeah again part of what I was looking at was that the way in which women are um, using these garden spaces as a way of uh, thinking about themselves, uh, representing themselves to a to wider world and so on. And the stuff that really came out of it was questions about, um, in particular, about retirement and about solitude. Um, about, again, as I say, how it, what it feels like to be in these, in these garden spaces. Um, for men, it's often framed in terms of uh, intellect so you'll have lots of um, garden inscriptions or uh, statues and busts and those kinds of things and it says this is about yes it's about a garden but it's also about um, uh, a life of the mind and so on so it's making kind of public statements and there's an expectation that women don't do that um, and one of the things I did find was that uh, although the gardens don't actually look different from gardens designed by men um, what you get is a um, really striking degree of articulacy amongst women writing about their gardens, um, in part because they see them as spaces to think about themselves, um, both um, in relation to their own household and, and their, their place in the world. Um, and that might be that uh, in some cases it's women who are um, suffering from depression and use gardening as, as a way of um, holding the world at bay almost. Um, for others it becomes a way of um, demonstrating that you are um, just as able as men to um, to create, uh, to produce gardens to um, and that you don't need to apologise. Um, last bit of that I suppose I would say is that the, the other real problem for women is that um, although it gets to kind of hidden away now to some extent. Garden, gardens are these hugely kind of sexualized spaces in, in all sorts of ways. So um, some of the most famous gardens in the 18th century like Stowe, full of um, kind of smutty quotations in Latin. Um, or um, you, walk into the, you walk into a temple and uh, it's got pictures of naked ladies on the ceiling. Um, so one of the questions really is what, what do women do with that stuff? Um, if you're a woman, how do you respond to a kind of sexualized space? Um, 
not in sexual terms. And again, that was one of the problems that a lot of women's letters um, deal with one way or another. So we get this idea then of the male garden as a kind of um, almost like a more public facing yeah. um, space and the, and the female, the woman's garden as something that's actually kind of being created for them. And so what, when you say women were kind of writing about that and sometimes writing about it to, to talk about their own capabilities, what, what kind of writing are you talking about? Were women publishing or um, or were you reading letters? What, what, were, your, what were your sources? Yeah, no, it's a nice question. I mean, it's most, I, mean I, I mostly work with, with letters. Um, again, partly because there's a, it's not really an expectation that well-to-do women would um, would be writing um, about themselves. Mm. Um, that it's um, that that's part of the problem as well. That if you start talking about yourself, it becomes um, uh, self-concerned, immodest, and so on. So um, yeah, so my move has really been to to, to look to letters, um, and the letters are fascinating. It's one of those things that. Um, it's still an area that I think is under researched in all sorts of ways. Um, that there's an obsession in the 18th century with with novels, as though that's that's all there is, or um, male poetry. Um, a part of what's interested me is is um, the sheer number of women's letters which are out there, um, which are kind of underused in all sorts of ways, and which are absolutely fascinating in terms of, um, as I say, a kind of articulacy. I don't think you find in the same way in most. Um, men's letters about gardens or anything else, frankly. Um, that they're, um, they, they see letters as a way of um, uh, thinking about what it means to be a woman, um, how they uh, imagine themselves, um, yeah, domestically, how they think about their desires, um, how they think about what's, I mean, one of the big questions running through lots of women's letters is how, how you engage with, with questions about, um, self-interest, um, which ought to be um, acceptable, versus selfishness, the antisocial, and so on. And again, gardens become spaces for thinking through those kinds of those kinds of issues. The second part, then, the kind of sexualized um, garden space. I mean, do, do you get a sense of, of um, I know it's probably a huge kind of topic, but how did women deal with um, kind of trying to get around um, the fact that gardens had been, yeah, a, a male space or a reproduction of a kind of male way of looking at the, the world? Um, did they engage with that kind of head on or or, um, or did they find different ways of um, of doing yeah. that? I think, I mean, yeah, I think they do do it in different ways. Um, one of them, of course, is is to um, insist on your own kind of um, asexual moral status. You know, so um, there's a kind of pushing back against that that notion of kind of um, gardens as sexualized spaces by um, insisting, yeah, insisting on yourself as um, moral, asexual, not concerned with these kinds of issues at all. Um, that would be the case with someone like um, uh, Elizabeth Montague, the blue stocking um, up at um, Sandalford, um, not far from uh, Chawton, in fact. Um, but even then, what she had to deal with in letters was um, letters from men clearly imagining her as a kind of sexual figure in their own gardens. Um, so she's invited over, oh, we'll come to this garden, let's, you know, um, um, and then she's framed into in terms of um, a whole, you know, a whole series of uh, classical uh, motifs, all of which are, um, yeah, sexualized in, in one way or another. So you get that kind of move. Um, you get uh, one of the other figures I wrote about was Lady Luxborough, um, who is gardening in part because of a scandal in her earlier life, uh, where she's said to have had this affair with um, her friend's tutor. Um, and so she's, she's stuck in a garden, um, working on it, utterly aware that other people think of her as this scandalous sexualized figure. Um, and so for her, there's always this anxiety about how that garden will be read, um, because gardens are always kind of microcosms. They're always seen as a way of, um, they're, they're, they're an image of the person who makes them uh, in all sorts of ways. Um, so when people come to visit, uh, the easy move for people is to read her garden as an account of her on of her moral failings and, and so on. Uh, so you get those kinds of moves as well. Mm, that's really interesting. I think, yeah, our, our listeners can take heed. Your garden says a great deal about you, I think. Um, I suppose that's also kind of 
thinking a little bit about um, problems um, with pleasure, which which brings me on to my next uh, kind of set of questions, um, which is about your um, current research project. So um, this is a, a new book um, entitled Pleasure Gardens and the Problems of Pleasure in France, Britain and North America. Um, so I wonder whether um, you could start off by saying a bit about um, the, the kind of connections between um, gardens and pleasure. I think I've told you this story before, Kim, but um, it started from I was I was sitting in a I was sitting in a very sort of um, sophisticated garden in Washington DC some years back. Um, it was a garden that was attached to a research library that was, and it was full of um, sort of learned inscriptions for in, um, you know, in Latin, in Italian, in English, all inviting you to respond in certain kinds of ways. As a kind of, I am a sophisticated person responding intellectually to the idea of the garden. Um, the problem was, I was sitting in this garden at the time um, at lunchtime drinking beer, um, and my response was largely. Mm, beer and ooh, that smells nice. <laughs> and it, and so it got it got me to thinking about and trying to redeem that response by trying to think about um, why is pleasure such a problem in gardens that we, we refer to these spaces as pleasure gardens, um, but what kind of pleasure? Um, and the, the thing that I was thinking about really was um, that question of different kinds of pleasure. I feel this pleasure. I should feel a different kind of pleasure. I'm sitting here drinking beer with an empty mind. What I should be doing is thinking high intellectual thoughts of this kind or that kind as, you know, gestured to by inscriptions in the garden and, and so on. Um, and it was really that that um, got me to try thinking about, um, well, what is going on in, in these kind of 18th century gardens across um, France, Britain and, and North America? And the reason I put those together is that, well, two reasons. One, one is that they're often seen as very disparate in some ways, that uh, just in terms of what they look like, um, French gardens seem very obviously different from um, English gardens. American gardens often framed as uh, a sort of late, not very good version of English gardens, although that's wrong. Um, but the, what runs through a lot of writing of different kinds, and this is where I kind of went with it, was, um, repeatedly the how people think about these gardens um, turn on these questions of pleasure um, so if you take for example famous french gardens like versailles or volvicon but versailles in particular um, if you read someone like madame de scudery she's writing at the end of the 17th century about a kind of policing of pleasure if you like that um, it's a pleasure garden but it's really for the pleasure of, of louis the 14th um, and so individual pleasures are all being kind of um, schooled in a certain kind of way that you have to, um, you do a route through the garden, uh, it's a theatrical experience, and you um, are required to respond in particular kinds of ways. Um, so yes, it's about pleasure, but it's about this kind of schooling of pleasure and saying you respond like this, this kind of pleasure, not any other kind of pleasure. And it's about the power of the king in some ways. I mean, that's the kind of caricature of it, but that's the that's kind of element of it. Um, alongside that, um, you also have in the, in the 17th century um, a whole series of um, those really long um, French romances um, that are, you know, 14 books long and um, obviously well read. Um, and in them, there are often these really kind of detailed accounts of, um, of gardens. Um, a part of what they do is, um, again, invite you to uh, respond in, in uh, intellectual ways. And so they they get that gardens of these places of delight, of um, sensuality and so on. But they still want to kind of school that as, um, OK, yes, you feel delight. Here's how you should think about it. Um, and so it's moralised, it's politicised and so on. Um, so. That move with that kind of notion of the kind of, of schooling and policing of, of pleasure um, runs one into all sorts of kind of questions about how people think about pleasure at all. And one of the one of the problems in the 18th century is that it's thought about in a range of different kinds of ways. So um, uh, you get someone like Burke saying that um, pleasure and pain um, are uh, we might think about them as related to each other. Um, Locke would say pleasure is the opposite of pain 
Burke would say, oh, they're not the opposite of each other. Um, they're just extremes in different kinds of directions. And one's normal state is a is a state of uh, nothingness, really. <laughs> it's kind of just, of, um, just tootling along somehow. Um, and you have these different kinds of extremes. But you also get a model from someone like um, Bishop Barclay, who would say there's three kinds of pleasure. That there's pleasure of um, reason, there's pleasure of imagination, and there's pleasure of the senses. And for someone like Barclay, um, those are inevitably um, going, going to be hierarchical. So it's going to be uh, reason at the top, the senses at the bottom. OK. And what it seems to me that does in, in terms of what you do in a the garden, then, is it raises questions for you. Of what kind of pleasure should I be having? Um, I should be having these rational pleasures. Um, I should be thinking great thoughts. I shouldn't be drinking beer or smelling the flowers. Um, and so... Gardens then get to be these, these interesting spaces because they confront you with that sense of what should I do? What do I want? How should I behave? And so the pleasure thing is really a way of getting at uh, how do you think about yourself? How do you think about uh, what you want, what your desires are, how you think about your place in the world? And crucially, I think also, um, as with my beer drinking episode, um, it's the acute awareness of what you think other people think. Um, what should I do? How do other people think I should behave? What am I going to do with that? Um, and that's really the thing that's interesting me ac across French gardens, English gardens, American gardens. That's yeah, that's really interesting. So it's not it's not necessarily like a kind of personal response, um, an immediate personal response, but more thinking about how other people see you. So 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 you're looking again at letters, but also at the kind of the way that um, yeah, the way that pleasure is kind of mediated through other forms as well. Yeah, so I mean, letters, letters is one thing. I've, I've got, yeah, I've got kind of obsessed with letters because they, they seem so fascinating in all sorts of ways. Um, but it's partly letters, it's partly um, the cues which gardens themselves are, are designed to kind of create. So how you read those garden spaces themselves, what they invite you um, to do. Um, also kind of, and the other half of this, I think the, the what should I do stuff is partly... Um, constructed on in by all of that kind of public writing about gardens that says behave like this um so for example uh, one of the other one of the other chapters is on, is on flower gardens um and you get all sorts of I, we were talking about this earlier but all sorts of moralizing about flower gardens um and so um there's a very odd book from the middle of the century um which is a series of meditations uh, by james harvey um, and he, he wanders around a, a kind of imaginary garden and every plant gets moralised in various kinds of ways. We'll look at this one. Now we will think moral thoughts about it. <laughs> uh, and now over here, different kinds of moral thoughts. We'll, thought, we'll think spiritual thoughts of God and so on. Um, and it's incredibly sort of clunky in all sorts of ways, but was um, oddly popular. Um, and the thing I find fascinating about it is that one might read that alongside the other end of my period, which is um, uh, the early United States, early years of the, the 19th century, um, where you get some extraordinary, I'm back to kind of letters and diaries, but some extraordinary um, letters and diaries by um, kind of young women um, Methodists um, who also then have this real problem about pleasure. Um, and the experience of a garden, just as someone like John Wesley does. Uh, so John Wesley in the late 18th century um, would say, uh, you know, he, he'll describe someone like Stowe or Stowerhead um, and then in detail take great delight in it and then say, and must all these be burnt up? Um, well, yes, they must, because the, it's the, you know, the end of the world comes and, you know, and his response then is what, what becomes of us if we set our hearts on these things? Um, so that that pleasure of the garden, um, yes, it's pleasurable, but it's also dangerous and it's unchristian in some ways to hold on to these things. It's like setting the heart on something, but it's also partly kind of to do with the body and setting the body on it and a, and a kind of body. Exactly. That there's there's this real tussle between the um, this 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 framing of, of the sensual and the bodily versus uh, spirit. Um, and, and so on. And so again, the kind of, um, to come back to my uh, Methodist women in, in the early United States, um, they write extraordinary letters about um, these moments of 
seeing, you know, seeing a lily um, in the way that someone like um, James Harvey would say, see a lily, think of God. And they do. Um, and it's horrifying in some ways, you know, that it's this kind of because what it does is you see this thing of beauty, you, you're drawn to it in some kinds of ways, and you think what a terrible person you are. Um, you think about your failures, you think about your inability to be as pure as that lily and so on. Um, and so th that other element, I think, of what's happening with gardens is that they're always inviting you to be in different places at the same time. That um, that kind of, they're partly about the physical object, uh, the stuff, you know, the physicality of the world in front of you, about your own body, as you, as you say, Kim. Um, but the other element of that is that there's this constant sense that they're an invitation to be elsewhere, to see through them to the world beyond and so on. And if you fail to do that, if you hang on to the bodily and the sensual, um, then then this is this is a kind of spiritual failure. Do you think that's still um, going on now in the way that we respond to, to, to garden spaces? Well, it is with me drinking beer in um, <laughs> in Washington. Um, yeah, I, do, I mean, I do. I mean, I think there's this um, one, one of the hard things to, to deal with when you try and write about gardens and you look at um, a lot of 18th century sources, but it's not just 18th century sources, is um, that there's a, a, an odd kind of um, inarticulacy about a lot of this. So uh, there's, there's a famous mid 19th century poem um, called The Garden. Um, and it starts with this line about the garden is a lovesome thing, God what? Um, and within a, within a line, it's turned to complete inarticulacy. You know, so, oh, it's lovely. God, what? Uh, well, God knows, yeah, but what? What? Tell me. And it can't. Um, and so, again, there's this sort of issue of um, how do you say stuff? How do you say things about gardens? Um, and a lot of the time, um, an awful lot of writing about gardens through the 18th century and beyond uses just words like lovely, fine, beautiful, and so on. Um, so part of what I'm interested in, how you get past that language to what are you trying to get at? How do you feel? How do you use a kind of incredibly kind of quotidian language um, to say something about how you feel? Um, and so, yeah, I do think that's, I think that remains the kind of issue that there's a kind of problem with, um, with what language you use in the same way as, um, I don't know if you know that um, lovely book that came out in the 20s, maybe the 30s, um, George Mikash's How to Be an Alien. Um, so Mikash does this lovely thing. He's Hungarian. He comes to Britain. And he explains Britain to, um, to British people in the 20s and 30s. Um, but one of his, his, his uh, really lovely lines is that he has a, a page where he says, if you stand two middle Europeans in front of a beautiful landscape, um, they'll look at it for 10 minutes and then they'll turn to each other and one will say, ah, wasn't it Goethe who said blah de blah de blah And didn't Sheila say such and such about the sublime and so on? And he says, if you stand a, a British person in front of um, that same landscape, they'll look at it for 10 minutes, turn to the other person and say, nice, isn't it? <laughs> um, and again, it's that kind of, it's that kind of problem of um, what do you want to articulate? But also I think um, the, the, the flip side of that is not wanting to do a certain kind of intellectualizing of garden spaces. But what you want to hang on to is the it's lovely and you ruin it with the articulating in uh, intellectual terms. So that's my justification of drinking beer in gardens again. <laughs> How do you hold on to an experience? Exactly. Yeah. So you're looking at French and American and British gardens um, in this project. And could you tell us a little bit about um, the, the, the differences between those between those spaces? Yeah, I mean, I think in um, in formal terms, I mean, they, they, they look quite different um, in that. Um, French gardens from the middle of the 17th century onwards, La Nôtre's gardens, um, all the way through much of the 18th century until the French start doing English style gardens. Um, they're, they're geometrical. Um, and the standard thing that would be said about those those gardens is that they're, um, that geometry and that kind of insistence on form um, is aligned with um, French politics, with, uh, if you're British, you would say, uh, in the 18th century, you would say, it's all about tyranny. Um, because it's about absolute control over the landscape. You have these huge avenues heading out across the, um, out from the from the garden, across the park, and so on. Um, and everything kind of focuses on the um, on the royal palace and so on. Um, 
And so from a British perspective, the line would be to say French gardens are unnatural. Um, from a French perspective, of course, it's, it's not that at all. What it's looking at is um, the, the kind of abstractions of nature itself behind the kind of um, particular, you know, the particular form a tree takes. So the reason you might turn something into a, uh, cut something into a globe um, or into a triangle or, but the, this, is, this is the basis of nature. Um, that you, so we've got two different versions of how you might imagine the natural world to be. Um, so you, again, I was, we were talking earlier about how you see through natural forms uh, to something else. Well, part of what's happening with those with those French gardens is that they're saying this is nature. See, see what nature really is. You see behind the kind of um, the oddities of of individual trees to natural forms, natural shapes, and so on. Um, Nevertheless, they have a very particular kind of um, visual form, um, and it is very much, it's uh, not entirely symmetrical, but it's certainly geometrical. Um, at the same time, though, um, absolute fascination with flowers. So uh, Versailles is, is full of flowers from all over the world. Uh, it's absolutely about those things, too. So. Again, it, you can get fooled by just looking at a, a map or a drawing and thinking this is all about geometry and nothing else. Um, it moves between those kinds of large scale imaginings of um, uh, geometrical form of a garden through to individual flowers and the pleasures of uh, smelling flowers and so on. And lots of kind of contemporary uh, engravings of uh, French gardens clearly make that point. So that they, they fill in little figures who are doing different kinds of things in gardens. So you might be on the kind of route with um, Louis XIV, where you have to follow a particular path, but you might be sort of dallying in, in amongst the kind of flower beds and so on and enjoying those things too. Um, the move of the English gardens is a classic thing to say about English gardens is that um, and the reason they're, uh, they're often it's, it's often called the natural style um, is that it models itself more on um, uh, a kind of supposedly untouched landscape. So instead of straight lines, you have curving lines um, instead of uh, an insistence on geometry. Um, it, it models itself on um, actually lots of Italian landscapes of the 17th century. Um, so lots of English landscape gardens through the middle of the 18th century try to look like um, French painters' versions of Italian gardens uh, or Italian landscape around uh, you know, the middle of Italy um, in the 17th century. So it's still kind of artifice, but it's a different kind of artifice that claims to be natural and so on. Um, American gardens, the old story used to be, yeah, we were talking about this earlier, but not very good English gardens, um, that they're behind the times and so on. Um, and I think that's just straightforwardly wrong. It's a kind of misunderstanding of, what, of what's going on. Um, but there is, a, there is a kind of interesting kind of issue there in terms of uh, what would an American garden be? What would it look like? Um, and someone like Thomas Jefferson is fascinating for that with Monticello, which is one of the kind of great American gardens of the kind of late 18th, early 19th century. Um, because he starts off trying to, uh, imagining that he's going to produce the kind of English garden. Um, in the, at the end of the 18th century, um, and then just realised this is not going to work. Um, the, the, um, the landscape and the uh, climate of Virginia doesn't produce, doesn't allow you to produce an English-style garden. But the other element of that is that um, maybe you don't want to produce an English garden either. So um, when he travels around English gardens with um, uh, another to be president John Adams um, there's a, a kind of lovely tour that they do together and they both describe all of these English gardens John Adams is fascinating because what he sees in English gardens is not uh, he, he recognizes that they're beautiful but he sees them as utterly luxurious and decadent so what he reads is the decline of empire um, in the construction of English gardens so um, you get this kind of odd, odd model where uh, in the middle of the 18th century, the, the English look back on French gardens and say uh, decadence, tyranny and so on. Um, by the end of the 18th century, you have Americans looking at English gardens and saying decadence, tyranny, luxury, fall of empire. Um, we are going to be different. But also, of course, the thing that someone like John Adams does is um, where... Jefferson wants to create Monticello as this uh, extraordinary garden, which he does. Um, 
John Adams' line is not to say, I want to have a garden, it's to say, I want a farm. Um, and so he, lo he longs for his farm in his letters, um, just as um, Jefferson longs for his, for his garden. And it's a real kind of clash about what is America? Um, so how do you frame America? Um, with Jefferson, part of what he does is, um, because there's a limit to how much he can do at the top of a mountain um, to create something even a bit like an English garden, um, what he does is focus in part on uh, things like his vegetable garden, um, and he frames it as a scientific venture. So the garden becomes a, a, a version of um, enlightenment science. Let's see what we can grow, what, what is it possible to produce in America, and this we can then use to expand um, the American empire. Um, so you have that kind of version of things, um, and Jefferson frames himself in terms of that. Back to what we were talking about with women though, the other thing Jefferson does is think flowers, they're for girls. Um, and so he, he links uh, his flower garden more particularly with the women in the family and his own scientific adventures as manly um, and linked with vegetables because the vegetable stuff is about, uh, yeah, is about empire, um, is about productivity and so on. And as I say, meanwhile, John Adams, his you know, close contemporary, um, is just doing, it's not about gardens, it's about farming. Farming is what's going to make America great. Um, so again, that kind of that kind of clash of that kind of clash of models. There is so much kind of going on there. Then not just a space for um, uh, having a kind of moral or an aesthetic experience, but also a space into which uh, all these questions about empire and nation and kind of much bigger questions than the self uh, are also being. And the other thing that goes with that, of course, is slavery. That so, um, with Monticello, uh, one of the striking features of Monticello is its West Lawn. Um, which is kind of slightly English style in some ways, and you could read as a sort of slightly old fashioned English English garden. Um, a main lawn to the west of the house, um, flower beds around the edge of it, um, linked in Jefferson's mind with um, the women of the family in particular. Um, but it's right next to um, Mulberry Row, which is um, a set of kind of slave quarters. Um, where uh, the people who are actually um, running the estate, uh, producing the things to build the house, uh, working on the garden and so on, um, that's where some of them are kind of on show um, as an idea of uh, what's wrong with slavery almost, um, because it's a happy part of a productive estate. Um, so you get this odd mix of um, a kind of West, West lawn, which is about a kind of white privileged aesthetic um but alongside it um a kind of group of enslaved people who you can't quite see but you definitely be able to hear um because it's it's kind of productive spaces where you're making bricks it's where you're making nails and so on um and it's not it's not hidden uh, so it raises questions for how jefferson is thinking about the larger plantation of which the garden is a part um that you might think well you're going to hide your slaves uh, he's not hiding his slaves um, but they're seen as part of um, the way in which that estate is, is, um, is working. Um, whereas if you turn to someone like um, Mount Vernon, George Washington's place, there's been some really nice work done on um, the way in which Washington increasingly um, designed uh, the layout of the estate and the, uh, the way in which he moved visitors around the gardens um, to... Uh, make sure that they didn't see his enslaved laborers. Um, so that the uh, slave laborers pushed further and further away from the garden space because the garden space is white. The garden space is uh, is America. It's an account of America, uh, but it's an account of America that has no real place for um, the enslaved people, which are actually producing that um, producing that landscape and producing the wealth of that landscape. And I suppose that's what you know. That's what you would expect. So it's all yeah. jarring to find, yeah, en enslaved people kind of situated right in the site of pleasure. Yeah. I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to wrap it up um, there, unfortunately. But thank you so much for um, okay. the food for thought, um, and I hope everyone else enjoys it as much as as much as I have. <laughs>